Hi there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this is a reminder that you are tuning in to the Altarum Healthcare Value Hub webinar, the marathon after the sprint, ensuring value and equity in the future of telehealth. Um, this is a value session. This was a two-part webinar. The previous session was focused on equity, and that was held last Friday. And you can find that on our website. We will definitely be sending out the link. Um, along with other fantastic resources from our speakers in a follow-up email to everyone who registered for this. Since we are at the top of the hour, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, and a reminder that you can find this recording online, um, and we will send out that link after. That's me. My name is Annalisa Johnson. I'm a Policy and Communications Analyst here at Altarum. Um, and before we get started, let's take care of a few housekeeping items. All lines will be muted until our Q&A portion, and then you'll have the option to unmute yourself to ask questions. Don't worry if you can't unmute right now. We will give you those instructions later on. Um, we're very eager to hear your thoughts. Reminder that we will only be able to hear you if you're dialing in via your phone. Computer audio is listen only, but you can also use our chat box over here on the right um, to let us know your questions. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website for those who are unable to join, so please keep that in mind when you're asking any questions. If you do experience any technical issues, please reach out to my colleague Elise Lowry at elise.lowry at altarum.org. We do also have a hashtag for this event if you want to follow along on Twitter. It's hashtag telehealthvalue. So it's no secret that COVID-19 has rapidly happened telehealth adoption. The ability to provide telehealth has been helped by federal and state policy changes, making it easier for providers and patients to engage in these practices by loosening restrictions on telehealth coverage, establishing more equal parity between telehealth and in-person visits, as well as waiving or reducing co-pays for certain populations. While these federal and state policies have certainly expanded access to telehealth, They've also raised questions about how we can protect value in current and future telehealth usage. Is it always appropriate to reimburse for telehealth services at the same level as in-person visits? And how can we ensure that policies are not encouraging low-value care in telehealth and that it's actually being used appropriately? How do we incentivize high-value care in telehealth? These are just some of the questions that our wonderful lineup of speakers is going to touch upon today, and I'm going to introduce them briefly. We have um, Mark Fendrick, the director of the Center of Value-Based Insurance Design um, at the University of Michigan. He's also a professor at the School of Public Health at that school as well. We also have Nicholas Berlin. Um, he is a National Clinician Scholar Fellow at the University of Michigan's Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation, as well as Christina Cutter, who is also a fellow um, National Clinician Scholars program at the University of Michigan Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation. Sorry, that was a lot of words for me to get through, and I've only had two cups of coffee today. And finally, our last speaker is Lewis Levy, who is the Chief Medical Officer of Teladoc Health. Our speakers will be discussing these complex issues around value and telehealth. And without further ado, I will go ahead and let them get started. Up first, we have Dr. Fendrick, and I will go ahead and give you control of the slides. Thanks. If you could move to the next two slides. And Elisa, I want to thank uh, you and all your colleagues at the uh, Altarum Health Value Hub. And also want to uh, thank my fellow panelists. Uh, I'll set the stage here and turn it over to, to the experts. But before we get started, I think as much as we'd love all to be in person, uh, if you could go to the next slide, sorry, we just have to remind everyone uh, why we're sitting at home and why we're doing this webinar. And I want to thank uh, all the selfless individuals who are putting themselves at risk to defeat this pandemic. Those of us in Michigan were so pleased to see the trucks roll from Kalamazoo this weekend. And now uh, vaccines are being administered into the arms of hundreds of thousands and soon to be millions of Americans. So we're very excited that the light might be at the end of the tunnel. Uh, next slide, please. So just to set the stage here, and, and I think this, um, webinar is really well titled about the marathon after the sprint, and we're so pleased to follow uh, the first segment of this webinar, speaking about equity, which is such a critically important issue, uh, not just in the COVID-19 pandemic, but in healthcare in general. And, I, and as we talk about uh, the value of telemedicine or the value of healthcare spending in general, 
I think it's important to realize that just about everyone agrees there's enough money in the U.S. healthcare system, particularly as we evolve into this new normal post-pandemic. We just spend it on the wrong services in the wrong places at the wrong time. And as most policy deliberations, at least before the pandemic, were on alternative payment and pricing models, it was very important, uh, we felt, to also focus on the consumer and the fact that the potential alignment of incentives for consumers and providers would lead to a desirable outcome in terms of making the services that we deem to improve individual and population health, population health would be accessible and affordable, and those that weren't uh, would be deterred. Next slide. So we were making a fair bit of progress, and uh, then, of course, came this pesky virus, the coronavirus, and threw everything uh, into complete disarray. Next slide, please. And what I'd like to point out as someone who has tried for two decades and worked with Altarum quite extensively over the years to buy more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff, this slide is just one of many studies out there showing how the impact of the pandemic impacted high-value services. This particular slide is preventive services, but this is the same holds true for the management of chronic diseases and other types of things, a big decline, at least through the summer, of high-value services. The good news, next slide, is that there was a decrease in low-value services and harmful services as well in the fact that we got to reset. And it, it's quite unusual for someone who didn't have great sympathies for many of the constituents in the healthcare delivery system that we saw tremendous decreases in revenues, particularly to our providers, such that we had to think very strongly about how we wanted to uh, align spending on the provider side with uh, optimization of individual and population health. What we didn't want to see happen, next slide, is this uh, tw tweet I stole from The Onion, which says, uh, patients rushed into unnecessary surgery to save cash-strapped hospitals. We do want to save uh, cash staff practices and cash-strapped hospitals, but want to make sure that the funds are flowing for those things that make our health improve. Next slide. So the paradigm uh, we put forth uh, was not particularly pertaining to telehealth, but applies quite well. High and low-value services, blue, high, uh, green, low, fell to remarkably low levels after the pandemic. It is our hope that the renewal or the post-COVID new normal would lead to more spending on good stuff and less spending on the bad stuff. In other words, seeing the blue line go above to where it was before the pandemic and hopefully keeping this green line low. Uh, next slide. So what we've seen is uh, more macro views of how we restored post-COVID. This is ambulatory visits, uh, reports put out by the Commonwealth Fund by our colleagues Ateeb Mahotra and Mike Chernu and others at Harvard, showing that we were basically back to where we were in terms of total ambulatory visits. But what these data do not tell us is whether these are high-value visits or low-value visits, clinically indicated visits or ones that could be managed by virtual care. Uh, the next slide. Uh, shows the same thing for hospitals. And I think the next slide is most importantly, as I'm about to turn this over to my colleagues, is that on the, you'll see that uh, we were all, during that sprint, uh, amazed, particularly those of us who were quite favorably inclined to push for telemedicine visits and coverage prior to the pandemic. We saw this massive increase, thousands and thousands fold increase of telemedicine view, use. But now as we settle into this new normal, we're basically seeing a plateau of telemedicine visits as you see on, on this slide. And, and the questions that I ask and the questions that Drs. Berlin and Cutter ask, and of course, Dr. Levy in the real world is, are the amount of telemedicine visits the ones we ultimately want to see to maximize uh, the triple aim of patient satisfaction, improved quality of care, and uh, maximum efficiency or cost effectiveness? So, and my next and last slide is here, which is basically saying as we move forward and think about the marathon and not the sprint, is first and foremost, we can't forget to where we were before. First, we have to build on alternative payment models that get away from fee-for-service and, and reimburse people based on the quality of care they provide. We also have to think about patients and make sure that their cost sharing is aligned with 
the value of underlying services. While uh, germane to the telemedicine discussion, it should be extended to all healthcare services and that fact that highest value telemedicine visits like the management of ambulatory hypertension, that should be encouraged strongly uh, with not only minimal or no cost sharing, but perhaps maybe a financial incentive uh, to keep people engaged. And then the last thing, which is going to be the remainder of our time, is how we might incorporate value-based principles that we had been long thinking about in terms of payment and benefit design to leverage uh, the excitement, the enthusiasm, my own patient's um, satisfaction uh, with the widespread adoption of telehealth. So how much, how many visits, how much we should pay for it, what we should do regarding uh, consumer incentives or not, and uh, I'm very pleased to uh, turn the microphone virtually over to my colleague, Dr. Nicholas Berlin, who will uh, go through some details regarding a potential policy and research agenda. Thank you, Dr. Fendrick, and thank you to Altarum for this opportunity. Uh, for those of you on the call today who are interested in learning more about some of the ideas that we're going to discuss in this webinar, you should check out our Health Affairs blog piece that we published this past October entitled Establishing a Value-Based New Normal for Telehealth. Okay, so Dr. Cutter and I have several objectives for our part of the presentation. And building on the first part of this webinar from Dr. Fendrick, I'm going to briefly highlight where we are now with regard to telehealth and what got us here over the past eight to nine months. Next, Dr. Cutter and I are going to propose a value agenda with policy and research objectives to guide us as we navigate consequential decisions about telehealth in the United States moving forward. And then finally, we're going to discuss several critical and perhaps overlooked topics related to telehealth that should be focal points for policymakers, health systems leaders, and other key stakeholders. Okay, so, so where are we now and what got us here? The pandemic has necessitated an unprecedented level of innovation and redesign in our healthcare system. One of the most prominent manifestations, often referred to as the silver lining of the pandemic, has been the widespread adoption of telehealth from a fringe technology to an essential mechanism for delivering care to millions of Americans. In addition to necessity, a series of key regulatory payment and benefit policies catalyzed these extraordinary changes, including but not limited to Section 1135 waivers, expanded use policies, and reduced cost sharing. And after the initial rapid rise in, in telehealth utilization, rates of telehealth have plateaued at a level much higher than what preceded the pandemic. You saw this in the figure that Dr. Fendrick showed just, just a, a few moments ago. We're now faced with a very important question. Do we embrace these new approaches to delivery and capitalize on this natural experiment to advance value-based care after the pandemic, or do we revert back to pre-pandemic operations? In our Health Affairs blog, we proposed a value agenda to guide decision-making for this new normal of telehealth in the United States. This framework is comprised of three related elements, which are depicted here on the right. These are a continuous learning system, a five-part policy agenda, and a five-part research agenda. Building on the foundation that Dr. Fendrick laid in the first part, Dr. Cutter and I are going to discuss these three elements individually. So in this new normal for telehealth, we'd like you all to appreciate how the policy and research agendas are actively interdependent. In the figure here, you see that the cyclical arrows highlight a, a relationship defined by an iterative process of policy implementation that is informed by knowledge gained through research. Embracing this continuous learning system of policy and research will guide us as we navigate these consequential decisions about telehealth with the overarching goal of supporting a delivery system that optimizes individual and population health as well as the patient experience. The United States Congress, CMS, other payers and policymakers need to consider long-term solutions that build on progress achieved during the pandemic and ensure access to high-quality patient-centered care while simultaneously reducing unnecessary spending and health disparities. That's a tall order in the midst of a long list of challenges posed by this pandemic. As we discuss in our piece, we believe there are five policy considerations to advance a value-based telehealth delivery system. Okay, so now to discuss the five elements of our value-based policy agenda for telehealth. First, we need to recognize and bridge the digital divide and access for underserved, vulnerable, and elderly patients. 
Socioeconomic barriers pose significant hurdles to equitable delivery, and preliminary evidence suggests that telehealth deployment has left some populations behind. To promote health equity, telecommunication devices may need to be considered medically necessary and covered by health insurance policies. Other options should be explored, such as expanding the FCC Lifeline program to provide phone and internet services to families at a reduced cost based upon income level. I believe this was also discussed in the previous uh, the first part of this webinar series on equity. Second, we need to align telehealth expanded use policies with key payment reform initiatives. Prior to the pandemic, there were several risk-bearing payment arrangements that offered greater flexibility to use telehealth services, such as the Comprehensive Care for Joint Replacement Program, the NextGen ACO model, and BPCI Advanced, among a few others. Prior to the pandemic, though, uptake of telehealth in these models remain low. CMS should preserve telehealth flexibilities within these initiatives as a means to prevent widespread overuse and to support further development of telehealth-specific digital quality metrics, such as those proposed and described in several recent health affairs articles by leadership from the National Commission on Quality Assurance. Third, we need to leverage principles of value-based insurance design, or VBIT. VBIT aligns out-of-pocket costs with the value of services delivered to patients. Grounded in the principle that financial barriers should be limited for essential high-value clinical services, like the ones that Dr. Fendrick alluded to. CMS and other payers should continue policies that reduce cost sharing for high-value services that can be delivered via telehealth and deter access for services that are not clinically indicated. Fourth, we need to incentivize telehealth utilization to support population health. Telehealth can transcend geographic constraints and support less resource settings. Reimbursement policy should incentivize telehealth-enabled mentoring and capacity building to enhance access to specialty care for facilities in rural and underserved communities. I believe there's some good examples of this happening in New Hampshire right now, specifically at Dartmouth. Finally, we need to strengthen protections against fraud and abuse. Permanent integration of telehealth into mainstream care must be matched with a commensurate investment and development of telehealth-specific initiatives within the Center for Program Integrity to proactively identify fraud, waste, and abuse. Now, given these time constraints for making consequential policy decisions, the implementation of this five-part policy agenda will drive the research agenda for telehealth. Dr. Cutter is now going to describe the research agenda and several critical topics that should be focal points for policymakers, health system leaders, and other key stakeholders. Thank you so much, Dr. Spendrick in Berlin. The rapid expansion of telehealth adoption during the COVID-19 public health emergency and, more recently, provisions under the final rule offer an unparalleled opportunity to establish a robust research agenda embedded in a continuous learning system that will generate knowledge to inform the next iteration of telehealth policies. The first element. We must seek to understand the impact of telehealth on access and utilization. Previous work by Dr. Fendrick and colleagues established that the introduction of medical innovation changes healthcare utilization patterns. Telehealth is no exception. During the public health emergency, telehealth facilitated continued provision of care to patients who were using healthcare services before the pandemic. However, its remarkable expansion also resulted in persons entering the healthcare system who had previously not sought care in the in-person delivery model. These changes in utilization represent a behavioral response to the transition of telehealth from fringe to mainstream. Many changes in utilization during the pandemic derive from necessity and risk-benefit recalibration. However, as illustrated earlier by Dr. Fendrick, a degree of this change is likely to endure. We describe those persons who would have consumed care in person for a clinical case presentation, but who switched to care furnished through telehealth for evaluation as converters, and those who would not have consumed care in person for a clinical case presentation, but who seek evaluation for that presentation when furnished through telehealth as newcomers. 
research should embrace the natural experiment afforded by COVID-19 to characterize the distribution of birth behavioral response to telehealth. And as eloquently described by our colleagues during the equity webinar, this should incorporate monitoring for signals suggesting evolving disparities. So why is understanding the behavioral response foundational to the value agenda for telehealth? This brings us to research agenda item number two. Analyses are conflicting regarding the influence of telehealth on cost of care delivery. It is indisputable, however, that we must consider not only the comparative cost on a per clinical case presentation basis, but also incremental effect on aggregate expenditure. The importance is probably best illustrated through an example. Consider, let's say, screening for colorectal cancer. If care furnished through telehealth results in fewer unnecessary or not clinically indicated screening colonoscopies, for example, in persons aged greater than 85 years, this could translate into per clinical case presentation cost savings. However, if telehealth results in a significant increase in demand for clinically indicated screenings from newcomers, who would not have sought this high value service without telehealth, then the described per clinical case presentation cost savings could be overcome by an increase in aggregate expenditure. Behavioral response to telehealth must be incorporated into analyses evaluating the impact of telehealth on cost of care delivery so we can realize more nuanced and improved estimates of the economic impact of widespread telehealth adoption. Policymakers will then need to develop effective strategies that nudge behavioral response based upon critical evaluation of marginal clinical benefit and incremental expenditure. Now, not only do we need to discern the influence of telehealth on healthcare expenditure, but we also need to elucidate its influence on appropriateness of care research agenda item number three. As is very familiar to this audience, low-value care accounts for billions in healthcare spending annually. And we all know that the consequent cascades of care for patients can be significant. This figure depicts that for different clinical presentations across time, telehealth could result in persons being able to access high-value services such as hypertension management, as alluded to by Dr. Fendrick, but also could result in patients receiving low-value services that are not clinically indicated, such as population-based vitamin D screening. Professional societies should leverage the recent surge in telehealth experience to develop clinical appropriateness criteria using approaches such as those embraced by the National Commission for Quality Assurance and Choosing Wisely Initiative. A person may be a converter or newcomer and receive high or low value care for different clinical encounters across time. It therefore becomes evident that understanding the interaction of behavioral response and appropriateness of care for services furnished through telehealth is essential for healthcare delivery stakeholders to align behavioral response with high value care. This is a critical knowledge gap for telehealth implementation. In conjunction with the proposed nuanced economic evaluation, this understanding could inform benefit design to finance more generous coverage for clinically indicated high value care furnished through telehealth with saved expenditure from reducing low value services furnished through telehealth as a lever to promote a higher value healthcare system. Research agenda item number four, we must develop, validate, and routinely implement infrastructure to measure clinical and patient-centered outcomes across settings. It is evident that the fiscal disruption caused by COVID-19 will force healthcare stakeholders to do more with less. It will therefore be more important than ever that decisions surrounding healthcare delivery, payment models, and benefit design are evidence-based and support telehealth services that improve patient and population health while deterring spending on those telehealth services that do not. 
quality measurement is a core component of the value equation and central to achieving this end. Patient experience is also a cornerstone of value-based healthcare delivery and must be deliberately measured and effectively incorporated to advance the value agenda. Now lastly, high value care is delivering the right care to the right patient at the right time in the right setting. And when this definition is applied to telehealth, it must be further expanded to include through the right modality, a topic of great discussion in the telehealth policy communities as highlighted in last week's webinar and conversations surrounding the final rule. The added value of burgeoning new telehealth technologies and disparate modalities, such as real time with video or audio, should be critically assessed. Research agendas should explore the sensitivity of utilization, appropriateness, outcomes, and cost ratified by patient population, clinical condition, healthcare setting, and telehealth modality. So we outline three elements, a continuous learning system, a policy agenda, and a research agenda that are interdependent, iterative, and must be advanced in tandem to support the value-based new normal for telehealth. Next step, will be informed by several critical questions. Number one, what are the infrastructure demands, such as wireless broadband, required to support equitable care delivery with telehealth technologies? How will this be evaluated, funded, and systematically implemented? And how can this be incorporated into broader systems level reform to decrease health disparities and enhance the preparedness and agility of our acute care system to respond to the next public health emergency. Number two, how can we operationalize platforms that enable measurement of access, clinical outcomes, patient satisfaction, and expenditure, amongst others, related to telehealth, while preserving interoperability and continuity of care? And how can this be done in a manner that decreases rather than augments administrative burden? Number three, every system is designed to get the results it gets. The complexity of healthcare in the United States, the number of established stakeholders, and the inertia of regulation renders a predilection towards return and maintenance of the status quo. As conveyed by Dr. Fendrick, COVID-19 revealed a healthcare delivery system with decreased low value care. As we begin to see signs of reversion to pre-COVID operations and policies emerging, we then must deliberately consider how we can build upon progress achieved during the pandemic and position the value agenda for telehealth as a pivotal strategy for a larger scale disruptive innovation to realize a new normal of higher value healthcare. Number four, Progress will unlikely be achieved without cross-sector collaboration. There are multiple possible formulations. So how will we determine the best or dominant approach to align healthcare stakeholders around value-based care delivery in the context of competing market forces and interests? So while 2020 may not be the year that medicine was saved, it will be the year where a pandemic presented an unprecedented opportunity to galvanize stakeholders to optimize healthcare value. The consequential importance of this silver lining should not be overlooked. Wonderful, thank you so much to all of you. That was fantastic. Um, I'm gonna move right along to Dr. Levy. I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself and you can take control of the slides. Thanks so much. Um, and thank you so much for the uh, earlier speakers. I really enjoyed uh, reading uh, in Health Affairs your blog about establishing a value-based new normal for telehealth. I enjoyed your blog so much, I decided to rip off the title uh, for uh, my own uh, talk here and uh, thought I would just share with folks a little bit of the view from uh, Teladoc Health. I, I thought I'd start out just giving a, a brief overview of the company and then talk at least how we tend to see uh, many of the policy issues uh, that lie ahead with particular emphasis on policies at the state level. 
we are uh, the largest uh, telehealth uh, company. Uh, we have in the U.S. alone over 51 million uh, paid uh, members, uh, and we've done over 15 million visits uh, since uh, 2015. And we have offices uh, all over the world. Uh, so many of the trends that we've been talking about uh, today, about how COVID-19 has transformed telehealth delivery, are by no means uh, U.S. Uh, phenomena alone. We really feel very impassioned about creating value for consumers. Uh, we see value as in very much uh, being uh, promulgated by having a single access point for what we call whole person care. We believe that uh, telehealth does represent a significant opportunity for taking unnecessary costs out of the healthcare delivery system. And we also believe very strongly in enabling care providers. So we have uh, leading hardware and software solutions uh, and work with several of the major academic medical uh, centers across the country, uh, as well as globally in terms of providing our technology to hospitals and health systems. In terms of how we see the future of telehealth, it's really <laughs> the notion of whole person value-based care. And by this, we mean uh, everything from that acute episodic in problem a cough or cold that might be going on for the last two or three days, to an individual who might be faced with metastatic melanoma and questioning the need for a clinical trial and would want to be accessing some of our expert medical services. With our recent merger with Livongo, we are impassioned about helping individuals with chronic conditions, such as the example that Mark shared, the individual with hypertension who could be successfully managed through telehealth, particularly enabled with remote patient monitoring uh, and AI. Central to all of these efforts is really that ability to uh, engage. We have a very uh, results-focused engagement science, uh, and we have married that up with much of the important work that has been done on the Lavanga side around hyper-personalization to really enable individuals to make sure that they are using uh, the technology appropriately uh, and that they stay engaged in terms of their chronic uh, condition. So what does this mean from a policy standpoint? How can we, in a sense, make sure that there is a marathon following the sprint and that the sprint is not just an isolated sprint and we basically revert back to December 2019. We feel fundamental uh, that enabling telehealth, one has to be able to basically say that a physician-patient relationship can be established using technology and not have these notions of, well, before it's a legitimate relationship, let's have that in-office visit first. Uh, we uh, believe very strongly that it should be modality neutral, meaning that if the patient is comfortable with a telephone call and the physician does not believe that a video visit is clinically necessary, perhaps the individual just needs a refill of a medication, that we should not force individuals into video visits if a telephone call will be adequate. We believe that asynchronous and synchronous interactions are critical, but obviously with appropriate safeguards. And that we feel very strongly about access to that individual medical record. So interoperability has been an issue as, as old as the electronic medical record itself. And we feel very strongly that in order for virtual care to really meet its potential, there needs to be a much freer flow of medical information. And obviously, HIPAA compliance is always going to be central. So what's happened since COVID? Well, as folks know, there's been a lot of relaxation over state licensure requirements, creation of consortium. Uh, but it's really been a mixed bag of response. No action taken in some states, emergency orders in other states, come one, come 
rural approaches in still other states as well. We think that there's a huge opportunity for simplification. Uh, we believe that there have been a number of multi-state licensure compacts that can really be simplified and have a much more uniform approach. We think that it's important that licensure waivers don't become overly burdensome in terms of terms and conditions, and that we really make it easy for high-quality physicians to deliver their care on a nationwide uh, basis. In terms of payment, we believe that it should really be governed by flexibility, uh, not by mandates. So we feel that um, providers should be fairly compensated for the services that they provided. Uh, but we don't believe that states should begin to mandate a specific payment rate or reimbursement amount. And we're certainly totally supportive of this notion of moving away from a fee-for-service mentality and having much more of a broader adoption of a value-based agenda. Uh, we believe that mandating payment and reimbursement parity for virtual care can potentially remove savings opportunities, and we would prefer to see uh, these types of payment arrangements being basically constructed in a way that's sensitive to the local environment and the overall needs of the community, and again, not a uh, mandated uh, requirement. On the federal level, uh, we feel as though Congress should eliminate, again, that geographic and originating site requirement, that notion of I need to see you in the office first before we can bill for a telehealth visit. Uh, we also believe that Medicare should allow telephone-based communication. There obviously needs to be an expansion of broadband capabilities, but in the meantime, we currently are offering our services through the app, through the mobile web, through the internet as well as the phone, and we believe that it's important to support all of those modalities of uh, communication. We also believe that CMS should seek to broadly expand the list of eligible medical care telehealth uh, services that have already been demonstrated to be safe, effective, and clinically uh, appropriate. We're very happy to announce that we just found out actually this week that uh, ARC has uh, funded us uh, a very important R1 competitive grant looking at the COVID-19 pandemic and telehealth and the impact that it has had on utilization, outcomes, disparities, public health surveillance. And we hope it to be publishing uh, these findings. This is our third uh, ARC grant. Uh, we're doing another ARC grant that has to do with antibiotic utilization, and a third ARC grant with uh, researchers at Harvard Medical School around appropriate uh, clinical follow-up. And we do believe very strongly that a robust research agenda really helps us to further demonstrate and communicate the importance that when you think about telehealth, you should not just think about it as, quote, convenient care, but rather convenient access to excellent care. We also feel very strongly that Medicare should enable virtual chronic condition prevention uh, and management. Uh, finally, uh, we do believe that Congress, which has on an emergency basis allowed uh, the prescribing of controlled substance to allow this to continue for DEA registered practitioners to be able to in an ongoing way begin to prescribe controlled substances such as medication-assisted treatment to try to help through telehealth tackle the uh, opioid uh, epidemic. And finally, in terms of fraud, waste, abuse, and patient safety, we believe that there are great tools already in place in terms of healthcare fraud and abuse control. We also think that telehealth is unique in that it is so easy to monitor what is actually being delivered through the virtual platforms. We believe that federal policy should support and incentivize the adoption of interstate compacts 
and that we believe that the FDA should apply sufficient regulatory scrutiny to high-risk telehealth devices and clinical software that are currently being used in critical care uh, environments. So I hope that this has been helpful, and I really look forward to uh, answering any questions uh, that folks might have uh, during uh, the Q&A. Annalisa, back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Levy. That was fantastic. Um, so we are ready for our Q&A session. Um, you can always use the chat box to type in your questions. If you would like to unmute, you can press star six to ask your question. But we do request that you please do not put us on hold unless you have some really jazzy hold music. Um, just kidding. Even if you do, we don't want to hear it. I will go ahead and get us started with a question that Bruce Sherman posed. Is it appropriate to think about overuse of telehealth based on the ready availability of services? If so, how does this induced demand, as seen with worksite clinics, impact the telehealth value proposition? Um, I'll go ahead and turn that over to whichever speaker wants to take the floor first. So, Annalisa, hi, this is Mark. I'll go first and let uh, Lou give us the real answer. Uh, mm -hmm. Always uh, insightful from, from Dr. Sherman, who has been pushing so hard nationally to combine issues of equity and value in this space. And, and, and Bruce knows quite well that um, the term overuse is often used in parallel to value. So I think most of us would agree if telemedicine led to an increase in services that were clinically indicated, uh, we would all be pleased, uh, at least more pleased, to, to see those services as opposed to those or not. And uh, we all know, and Bruce and I have done work on this, that just about all the things that are quality metrics and we begged our patients to do are underused in this country. Uh, which is why Drs. Berlin and Cutter's point about what we need in terms of use of more clinically indicated services and less so, and I believe we worked that out. But I'd like to also tee this up to Dr. Levy and think, I don't like the term modality neutral. I actually like the term modality positive for those things that we deem to be better off for patients' uh, satisfaction and outcomes to be those uh, used first line and use the term modality negative for those situations where patients are actually in the wrong place. And Lou, as you know, that holds true both for in-person visits as well as telemedicine, which would allow us to determine what might be uh, the overuse that Bruce is talking about. Yeah, so I, I did want to clarify the term modality neutral, basically uh, in the context that I was expressing it, really was to clarify that we uh, did not uh, take the stance that telehealth means video consultation and that we were neutral, that um, we felt as though as a company we are modality neutral, meaning that we would really want to leave it up to the patient, uh, their own uh, preferences, as well as to the a clinician that's delivering the care. So if they felt as though it was clinically necessary to have a video consultation because of the clinical matter or because the patient just wants to see the provider, even if it is a med refill, we feel that as a company our stance is modality neutral uh, in that let the doctor and patient uh, decide. In terms of the question about, uh, you know, is telehealth basically uh, avoiding that costly emergency room visit, or if the individual did not have access to telehealth, would they have just gone and grabbed a box of tissues and there would be no health care expenditure? And I think the answer to the question is both. And we've done studies on this where we've asked individuals uh, what would they have done had they not had access to uh, our services? And we've done claims-based validation of these studies as well, and we have found that there has been an approximate ROI of about $300 per visit uh, for our general medicine services uh, in the U.S. Um, and as one knows, uh, even if there is some uh, use 
of the telehealth that might be deemed as being somewhat unnecessary, it doesn't take too many avoided hospitalizations and avoided unnecessary trips to the emergency room uh, to find that there can be a tremendous ROI associated with just a general uh, medicine uh, type uh, offering. So that is, you know, basically how we have tended uh, to view those issues. Uh, in terms of the chronic disease management, uh, similarly, uh, on the Lavango side, they have studied what does it mean to have improved blood pressure control? What does it mean to be engaged in a diabetic management uh, program? And they have similarly found um, some short-term savings in terms of avoidance of emergency room and hospitalizations because of better acute management of uh, very high and very low blood sugars and blood pressures, as well as being able to have more extrapolated findings about what that improved control means in terms of the life of that individual. Wonderful. Well, thank you both for those very thoughtful answers. Um, I am going to read out our next question in the chat box from Jonathan Foley. Some of the increase in telehealth during the pandemic has been attributed to new users of behavioral health services. Some of this growth has been linked to the breaking down of the stigma associated with behavioral health care. Have you studied the value of increased behavioral health care during the pandemic? I don't want to hog the microphone, but we sure have studied that. And there has been an absolute explosion of uh, the, the uh, behavioral health services uh, where uh, we are doing uh, millions of visits uh, in behavioral health. And uh, we have uh, looked at uh, clinical outcomes uh, in terms of improvements, uh, in terms of uh, various uh, depression screeners, anxiety screeners, to see the impact that our services have had. Uh, actually, uh, one interesting point that was brought up uh, at a recent meeting of our medical advisory board, Dr. John Oldham, heads up the manager clinic and uh, used to be the president of the American Psychiatric Association, noted that so much of a person's expressiveness can be seen by just looking at their face. And one of the ironies of the uh, uh, recent pandemic is that you know, an in-office mental health visit uh, where both provider and patient are wearing masks, you're losing a lot of uh, communication. So uh, there's actually a material superiority to uh, the telehealth visit just on a clinical basis of having a much better understanding of the individual because you can see their whole face, obviously, through the webcam than you could if both are kind of masked in the office. So just an additional uh, uh, attribute of telehealth during the uh, pandemic, specifically in the mental health sphere. But obviously, that access is being critically important uh, in terms of individuals uh, who need mental health services but might be reluctant to reach out because of stigma and other concerns. Wonderful. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and ask a question that I want to know the answer to. Um, specifically for Dr. Levy, you spoke about state licensure requirements. And um, I was wondering if there are any exemplar states that you think are doing a particularly good job in terms of license, licensure requests, or are there any that are particularly bad? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I think that. Uh, all, all states really do have an opportunity uh, to uh, improve uh, the ease with which uh, they can allow uh, individual providers to render their services. So uh, we do believe that many states have opened up their borders uh, during the pandemic. Um, you know, and we do feel as though uh, you know, if an individual has uh, diabetes and an upper respiratory infection, 
the treatment for that is not really much different whether you live in San Francisco or whether you live uh, in Boston. And we do believe that telehealth has the opportunity to provide the democratization of access to great care. So we would really like to see a more broad-based opening up. And we really do see that there is a difference uh, between, say, medicine and law, where obviously the state laws in California can be quite different than the state laws in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So it does make sense, in our view, obviously, for you know individual attorneys to pass local bar exams. But I don't think that that really holds true uh, with uh, state licensure and the practice of medicine. And I think it is time for us to have the conversation of what are we really able to achieve through all of these various state licensure requirements, and does it really make sense to continue to maintain these state licensure requirements uh, going forward? Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to pause for a second and let anyone who would like to ask a question go ahead and press star six to unmute. It seems like you're all being a little shy today, and that's fine. Um, I have a question in that case for our U Michigan team. Um, you touched briefly upon population health, and I was wondering if there are specific payment models that incentivize telehealth use to support population health. Um, and if you happen to know of any promising case studies or examples, we'd be happy to hear about them. This is Mark. I think we're all deferring to Dr. Levy if he would, would know, because in, ter in terms of research in these areas, it's really hard given the, the fluidity and the dyna how, how dynamic the whole situation has been. But we do know that uh, these issues is probably very near and dear to Lou is uh, the, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission is closely looking at, at a number of these issues, and I believe they're actually attending today in terms of uh, what not only the health impacts would be, but what the uh, cost of the Medicare Trust Fund would be if there were some broad, consistent uptake of uh, telemedicine across the country. So that's my lead-in. I'm not sure if either of my Michigan colleagues want to jump in, but I, I'm sure Lou must, ha must have a, a comment to make on your, on your point, Annalisa. Yeah, I, mean, I think that increasingly, I think um, what we are going to have to wrestle with uh, are really uh, trying to figure out uh, the value of uh, hybrid models of care. So, uh, uh, for instance, you know, I recently had the opportunity to speak with a gentleman who helped a friend uh, move a very large couch and was having some chest discomforts uh, following that. Uh, uh, he uh, contacted Doc Health and was complaining about all of this musculoskeletal pain and uh, the doctor was asking questions and also noted, uh, you know, any shortness of breath. And the guy said, uh, yeah, maybe a little bit, but I put on a whole bunch of weight. Um, and I sort of am attributing to that. Well, at any rate, long story short, the doctor said, you know, I am concerned about the chest discomfort and the shortness of breath, and you may be having blood clots to your lung, and I think you should be seen at a local emergency room. He was seen, evaluated. The doctor was about to discharge Life. him, and the patient said, well, I had spoken to a virtual care doctor who thought I might be having blood clots, and the emergency room physician said, I think that that's highly unlikely, but if you want me to get a scan, I'll get a scan. And the patient said, yeah, I would like that because they seemed quite concerned. And lo and behold, he had multiple pulmonary emboli and was started on appropriate uh, treatment. So then the question is, what's the value of telehealth? You know, it did not avoid the emergency room visit. Would the individual have gone to the emergency room 
uh, immediately and avoided the telehealth visit, well, you know, he was thinking about, you know, discomfort in the chest because of helping the friend move and shortness of breath because of his weight, and maybe he would have taken Motrin, maybe he would not have done that. Uh, so I think as we look at the value, I think it's increasingly important, both in this instance as well as in other instances of diabetic management, uh, importance of doing sensory exams, importance of doing retina screenings and other modalities that are uh, difficult to accomplish in a virtual setting, that we begin to look at really the value of these hybrid models. Uh, rather than thinking uh, in binary, uh, in a sort of a binary way of let's look at brick and mortar care, let's look at virtual care and kind of stack one up against the other. Because I really do believe as we move into the future, uh, you know, ATMs have not put banks out of business. You know, you can still find banks on many a corner. So I think it really is that issue of what is the hybrid model yielding. Uh, but I think that the reality of it is that, you know, if we're going to continue on that analogy, we still have in our healthcare system many people waiting in the lobby of the bank because they would like to withdraw $20 from their checking account. And I do think that through technology we can avoid uh, those scenarios where, you know, when was the last time any one of us waited in a lobby for a considerable amount of time to withdraw $20 from checking? You know, so I think that we can thoughtfully have innovation uh, in a, a highly hybridized model. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Levy. Um, Dr. Fendrick, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Sure, thanks. I think Lou's making fun of me as, uh, as I stand in my bank lobby, but I'll, I'll let that uh, let that slide. <laughs> so, so two uh, closing points. I want to thank you, Annalisa, and the Altarum team, and, and certainly my U of M colleagues who uh, provide all the brains and all the hard work. One is uh, something I've talked to the Teladoc folks and really impressed by. I just put in the chat a editorial I wrote with another junior colleague about the importance of continuity in this new era of Teladoc, and we get away from what we knew five years ago of these one-stop shop uh, consumer-driven programs that uh, don't integrate, which is something Lou had uh, mentioned as a very important tenet of, of the Teladoc Livongo program. Oh, you know, I know you do. The other is something that I know Dr. Cutter and I but are really interested in, which ties a whole bunch of these things together, is when we think about population health and we think about clinically indicated use, uh, Teladoc, tel, telehealth may open a new opportunity for the third to uh, half in some populations of people who don't get any of the clinically indicated care. And uh, while uh, costs may certainly go up in the short term, I as a population health and a public health person uh, believe quite strongly that we're going to get people in the doors, these newcomers that Dr. Cutter talked about, uh, that we had not had before. Uh, like laparoscopic surgery did to open surgery, uh, like many of the innovations we've studied, it's a good thing when more people undergo an intervention if the clinical evidence supports uh, a positive effect on health. And if, if telemedicine can get uh, some of those people who just, um, for lots and lots of reasons, Lou, who don't engage with the healthcare system to engage with the healthcare system, I think that's one of the reasons why I'm so bullish on this whole thing. Wonderful. Well. Thank you all for those incredibly thoughtful comments to those questions. Unfortunately, we do have to wrap it up. We're nearing our end time. These are three products from the Healthcare Value Hub that we've put together about telehealth um, and health equity. We will be providing you with links to those in our follow-up email once we have all of our resources compiled on our website. And finally, I would like to extend a hearty thank you to all of our speakers, um, to Dr. Fendrick, Dr. Levy, um, Dr. Berlin, Dr. Cutter, thank you all so much for taking time out of your super busy schedules to be here with us and explain these, you know, complicated and new issues to us. Um, I'd also like to extend a thank you to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation 
And a reminder that you can register for future webinars at this address right here. That's healthcarevaluehub.org backslash events. And we will be sending out an email chock full of fantastic resources from the Hub, as well as the uh, resources that our speakers have put in the chat. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, everyone, for taking time out of your day to spend an hour with us learning about telehealth and value. We appreciate your time. Thanks so much.